a, a Topeka, Kansas State Fair in 1927. Um, and they're giving you this, you know, I think pretty graphic display, not only black and white thinking about kind of racism and racial ideas in the U.S. in the 20s, um, but also this idea of kind of how do you breed pure white, pure white, pure black, pure black, this kind of race mixing is, I think, at root beneath this guinea pig billboard. Next to the guinea pig billboard, though, there was something like this. Marriages, fit and unfit. Pure plus pure equals children normal. Abnormal plus abnormal, children abnormal. Pure plus abnormal, children normal but hated. Grandchildren abnormal, <laughs> etc. How long are we Americans to be so careful for the pedigree of our pigs and chickens and cattle, but leave the ancestry of our children to chance? Or blind sentiment, which is falling in love. Right? Um, even more kind of amazing is the second part. Unfit human traits, such as feeble-mindedness, epilepsy, criminality, insanity, alcoholism, pauperism, being poor, and many others, brought in families and are inherited in exactly the same way as color in guinea pigs. If all marriages were eugenic, we could breed out most of this unfitness in three generations. Now clearly this is a crass oversimplification. <laughs> but I will say that the nature, nurture, environment, genetic thing is still not resolved. These debates still go on. So I think it's really important to consider how this got so oversimplified and how people could kind of take this as a techno fix to social problems. How do you use science to fix society? Um, right next to the little house that I showed you that had the lectures, there's, there are often houses like this called Fitter Families for Future Firesides. And <laughs> the Fitter Families Contest, you could actually go in there with your your sister Sally and your brother Joe and your grandma, and a, a nurse of your own gender would strip you down, give you anthropometric measurements to determine if you were proportional in your body, how close you fit racial norms. Um, they'd ask you, you know, what is your dad a pastor? <laughs> Things like this that demonstrated morality <laughs> and education. They could give IQ tests. It was a full on, you know, medical exam to determine if you were a eugenic individual. And you could walk out of there with a medal if you were a grade A individual. <laughs> or if you were Sammy Joe and you got a C and your sister got an A, you could be really sad for the rest of your life, right? Um, you so here. Room, what? You have a room set over there. <laughs> I don't. I'm not going to strip anyone <laughs> So if you look here on the right, it's a blow up of the billboard that's on the screen porch, and it's me trying to get a photo of it. Are you a human thoroughbred? And basically it says, if Peggy's taking the cow down to get measured for a blue ribbon, you might as well bring her so she can get a blue ribbon for herself as well and win the governor's cup. Um, so there are two strands to eugenics. Positive eugenics was what was demonstrated by Fitter Families Contest. Try to learn if you have good heredity. If you do, well, by golly, marry someone who also has good heredity and have four or more kids. That's kind of the, the oversimplification of what they were trying to say. Generally, it was all whites. There was one Asian person I saw in the archives of Fitter Families, people who got measured. Um, so, so they pretty much pushed that white ideal. However, I will say eugenics was popular across ethnicities, with African American communities, Jewish communities, et cetera. So it's not that simple. Um, on the right is a mock-up for one of the medals you would get if you were grade A. And what you see, it says, yay, I have a goodly heritage. <laughs> and then, <laughs> it's almost like godly heritage, too, by the way. And you see, um, a Nordic couple or a classical Grecian couple from the Golden Age pouring the stream of life into their little son's hands. So this idea of the flow of the stream, I think this is one example. The stream, if you read eugenics sermons and everything else, the, the purity of the stream of life flowing out of the throne of God, this is the metaphor for DNA being passed on. The flow of the stream it has to be pure and it has to be Negative eugenics, on the other hand, tried to limit the reproduction of the unfit. So here you see a flashing light exhibit. Every 15 seconds at the top, the light would flash. And here's the economic argument. Every 15 seconds, $100 of your money goes for the care of persons with bad heredity, such as the insane, feeble-minded, criminals, and other defectives. On the left, every 16 seconds, someone's born. On the bottom right, this light flashes every seven and a half minutes. A high-grade person is born in the U.S. will have the ability to do creative work and be fit for leadership. About 4% of Americans fall in this class. And you were supposed to go to a Fitter Families contest to learn if you were one of those who were a burden on the rest. Um, this is from the late 1920s. And what I want to say about this economic rationale is that it strengthened incredibly in the 1930s when a worldwide depression hit. 
governments didn't want to fund care for defectives. They wanted to use their money for other things. So that was when sterilization became the ultimate solution to this problem. Um, here you see um, a poster from uh, a show from Germany, actually, that traveled the US for eight, what is it, eight years? Nine years. Eugenics in New Germany, sponsored and invited by the American Public Health Association. And we went through California, up to Oregon, to Washington, and over to Buffalo, New York. This poster shows a lunatic asylum. It says Germany was proud of having the best lunatic asylums. She will be proud someday to not need lunatic asylums any longer. The amount spent on them in 1930 was 100 million marks. And then it gives you the other figures that were spent for civil government, for the military, et cetera, et cetera, to show that it was above and beyond all other political expenditures. Um, basically, the rationale was that if you would sterilize individuals in state institutions, you could release them to their family so that the family could bear the economic expense of keeping these people alive. Whereas otherwise, if you didn't sterilize, then you had to keep them sexually segregated through their entire reproductive years. And that was a heavily heavy cost to governments. So um, basically, in terms of kind of going back to my five points of the comparison of eugenics and streamlining, eugenicists wanted to eliminate degeneracy, as they defined it, by control controlling evolution. They wanted to increase the smooth flow of the stream. This poster on the left, by the way, is also from that German show that came here. Um, if this man had been sterilized, there would not have been born, and it lists 12 different types of defectives, uh, or children, on the left. And he's characterized as a poor, poor black man. So. Um, in terms of kind of thinking about the other three main points that parallel kind of streamlining and eugenics, um, clearly eugenicists were interested in increasing biological efficiency, making more productive citizens to save the government money, and kind of putting this whole idea of biological rationale for national governments as, as really an argument for how governments should deal with their citizens. Um, streamline designers were interested in biological efficiency in a slightly different way. And I'm, it's actually kind of a very interesting metaphor. They tried to eliminate all extraneous parts that cause parasite drag. Um, and so actually the idea of paras social parasites is a common theme in eugenics literature. Um, and you see here that by eliminating kind of all of that, those eddies that slow down, um, Norman Bell Geddes actually said he was eliminating parasite drag, which thanks to Lenny I now know is a physical term, but to me it seemed heavily biological in its connotation of this kind of parasitic idea. Um, along those lines, I'm showing you a redesign that Raymond Lowy did for Greyhound Bus Company. On the right, you see the older Greyhound, which does not look much like a Greyhound, and then you see his redesign to the Greyhound form. And I just want to raise this point because one of the things, if you look at kind of the history of health literature during this period, Different types of bodies were thought to be appropriate to different types of work, kind of like the thoroughbred draft horse kind of thing, where the draft horse were the lower classes, they were those with heavy musculature. Their bodies had so much energy being absorbed by muscles that supposedly they had less time for intellectual work. This is this idea. So you see him turning away what was often called parasitic muscles that were sapping you of your ability to use your energy for intelligence. Instead, you've got the sleek greyhound that won competitions, that had streamlining in its blood, that was an example, I think, of purebred speed and efficiency. Um, and I think it's just been interesting to think about that context. Um, along those lines, one of the things that Egmont Aarons did in his talk, Streamlining in Nature, where I showed you the greyhound before and the kind of streamlines, um, he, he had not this image, but two very similar ones. He had an image of an ox cart, and then he had next to it an image of Malcolm Campbell's race car setting the world record. Um, and here's what he said. He said, to drive, um, let's say, no, even a country yokel's slow wit is good enough at three miles per hour. Compare that with Malcolm Campbell going 300. You have to think 100 times as fast. And then he followed that in his speech with, this age needs streamlined thinking to keep pace with our streamlined machines. So I put forward this as an example of the ways that eugenicists were trying to increase intelligence, the ways that designers assumed we had to have increased intelligence to keep up with the speed of technology. And in fact, if you hear people talk about computers today and the way that we, they're gonna you know, outpace us in intelligence, we better do everything we can to kind of work with that situation or get up to speed and up to par, it's a lot of the same kind of rhetoric that's being used today as was being used back then. Um, both types of designers also aim to